Los Angeles, 3.9 million people, 6,500 miles of city streets, 6,500 miles of sewer lines, 230,000 streetlights, an urban forest of 680,000 public trees, trash collection for 720,000 households, and 5,800 dedicated people who make it all possible. The 5,800 employees of the Los Angeles Department of Public Works. Really, truly a family um, atmosphere. We have a lot of hardworking individuals that respect each other and work hard to support each other. What brought us all together was serving the residents of the city of LA. By being part of the wastewater system in the city with the Bureau of Sanitation, I feel I've been able to live up to one of my childhood dreams of really doing a job that protects the environment. We have five different bureaus, and the bureaus are like brothers and sisters. They reach out and they help each other. We do work as a big family. The City of Los Angeles created the Department of Public Works in 1905. The story of how the department came to be and its journey toward the 21st century is also the story of the city itself. Well, the reason the city was founded was it was a reliable year-round water supply available from the Los Angeles River. That was fed by artesian wells from the groundwater flowing out of the ground in the southeast corner of the San Fernando Valley. That made the river a year-round river, which is unusual for a dry area like this. And that was the reason the Spanish chose it to found a uh, farming community to support their uh, forts in the area. People tend to, when they build roads, is take the, the least uh, path of resistance. And that's the same way with animals uh, as they came up from the LA River. Many of our major roads or, or travelways were originally Indian trails, uh, they were natural trails used by deer, uh, coyotes. Every street in the city of Los Angeles was nothing more than a dirt trail. They were used primarily to bring goods into Los Angeles. Waste was, was collected uh, um, right where either people lived or just out back, if you will, uh, if you, uh, more or less in the, in the outhouse. Back in the early 1850s, mid-1850s, everybody was responsible for placing a lantern out in front of their home. When it got dark, those were our street lights. They were responsible for sweeping the street once a week. But LA's days as a small town were numbered. Los Angeles was becoming a huge trading center. Farmers from the San Fernando Valley to Temecula brought their produce to LA. The population grew, the economy grew, and the demands on the young city grew as well. With no set plan to deal with sanitation, to maintain roads, to keep the city functioning and growing, and with no infrastructure to deal with the day-to-day -day demands of the future metropolis, Los Angeles was edging toward chaos. As we continued to grow and expand, and as utilities became more and more available, uh, whether it was electricity, telegraph, all sorts of, uh, of new utilities were coming into Los Angeles, uh, the city realized that they had to have a plan because we were just growing too fast. As the city grows over time, you get a lot more wastewater generated. And so in the 1860s, people start putting in private sewers. The cities take over everything in 1873. They put in the first public sewer system in the city. And then it's collected. And then keeping with good economy of the time, they sell it to a farm, what's literally called a sewage farm and they've taken the irrigate crops that are turned, grown, and then fed back to the people. In 1855, the election of George Hansen as the first Los Angeles City surveyor and engineer marks the earliest beginnings of what would become the city's Bureau of Engineering. His surveys were among the first of LA's public works projects. As we grew uh, and more and more people came in, we, we saw the industrial side of Los Angeles start to develop, the manufacturing, things that were going on in South Los Angeles, uh, it became a major problem because nobody had an idea of how you were going to create this new infrastructure and more importantly, how were you going to maintain it. 
It would take time, but the city got the idea. Though it would still be over 30 years before there was a Department of Public Works, Los Angeles began to take a serious look at what it would take to make the transformation from a distant southwestern outpost to a modern city. In a matter of decades, LA would begin to see real sidewalks, street lights, a sophisticated sanitation program, and an engineering department that would take the lead in building the future of Los Angeles in the 20th century. In 1872, John Goldsworthy was hired as the city's surveyor and engineer at $10 a day. At only those days, he actually worked. Uh, we know that we had our first uh, superintendent of streets back in 1872, uh, Jasper Babcock, uh, a classical name for somebody back in that time uh, of our history. But he was the first superintendent of streets. He was the first guy that the city made responsible for maintaining the streets. And of course, most of the streets he was maintaining back in those days were primarily dirt or crushed rock. I can only imagine as he started to look at the, the street system and, and how to develop it, how to align streets and make them all connect, uh, it must have been a daunting task for him because uh, uh, he had no one to, to look, no past to look on. That fantastic growth, accelerated by the development of railroads nationwide, spurred an economic boom as the world discovered Los Angeles. Between 1880 and 1890, LA's population was growing from 11,000 to over 50,000 people. Sanitation became an even greater challenge. Then as the city grows and grows to the point, people when they start building around these sewage farms object to the odor and the smells. So the city looks at a new strategy. So starting in the 1880s, the city engineer Fred Eaton drafts a plan which separates the sewers from the storm drains, and they build a sewer out to the Pacific Ocean near um, Playa del Rey. And literally a pipe just went to the ocean and a very short distance out uh, into the surf line and the, the, the water flowed from within the city down that pipe and out into the surf. Frederick Eaton, the city's chief engineer, would later be elected the first locally born mayor. His plan for the city's first outfall sewer was helped by city engineer John Dockweiler who secured unconditional disposal rights to the Pacific Ocean. That 24-inch pipe replaced and extended in a few years with a 30-inch pipe as the population grew, set off at a location now known as Dockweiler Beach. Every aspect of life in Los Angeles reflected the pace of change in the 1880s. City Council uh, gave a franchise to the uh, to uh, a gas company, a local gas company, which had become, became the Southern California Gas Company, uh, to install some gas lights on Main Street. When electric lights began to make their appearance in 1882, the gas company protested, arguing that the new electric lights were hard on the eyes, produced color blindness, were bad for ladies' complexions, kept chickens awake at night, attracted bugs, and drew lightning. But you can't hold back progress. In 1882, uh, several 150 foot tall towers were built, like big flagpoles, uh, with a crow's nest partway up for what they called carbon arc lighting. These carbon arc lights lit up the whole area of the city uh, to the level of moonlight, roughly, which is pretty low level, but allowed people to see things. In 1905, Broadway had a lighting system installed we called a cluster of five lights per pole, the first ornamental system. In 1883, Public Works was given the power to order necessary sidewalk construction and repairs anywhere in the city. The board also took on house numbering and began to set an array of standards for building in Los Angeles for years to come. L.A. also passed a bond issue in 1883 that called for the building of a proper city hall. After 30 years of doing business in a simple wooden structure it shared with an insurance company and real estate office, the city council would soon meet for the first time in a municipally owned building. By 1900, L.A.'s growth had exceeded 100,000. It covered 40 square miles. Its reputation as the oil capital of the West would soon be overtaken by the arrival of the motion picture industry. From a city where most people had lived downtown, 
Los Angeles was spreading out. The automobile was arriving, and the first suburbs, driven by developers in places like Hancock Park, Hollywood, East Los Angeles, and Boyle Heights, absorbed the multitudes. Even the San Fernando Valley, with mostly farmland, was seeing the early development of major thoroughfares. In 1905, the city passed a charter amendment creating the Los Angeles Department of Public Works. The new department, under the charge of a three-person board appointed by the mayor, took on a complex task of guiding development. It now had responsibility for the design, construction, and maintenance of streets, sewers, storm drains, and city-owned buildings. It would be responsible for the disposal of garbage, sewage, and street refuse, and operate all public utilities owned by the city, except for the waterworks. The new Department of Public Works heralded an era of dizzying change. Yeah, you just have to admire the people of Los Angeles back at the turn of the century because uh, they wanted to be a big city in the worst way and they put their money where their mouth is and they passed the Viaduct Bond Act among other things and built these, these gorgeous bridges. Uh, they built everything for the future. When uh, the Department of Public Works created uh, the various bureaus that were identified uh, and made responsible for certain uh, elements of the infrastructure, um, they were quite smart in how they, they decided to, to share the responsibility. First of all, you had the uh, uh, Bureau of Street Services, uh, the Bureau of Engineering, and the Bureau of Sanitation. They were the first three uh, major bureaus uh, in the Department of Public Works. The engineering group, they were responsible for primarily designing uh, our roadways. The Department of Public Works took on one of the most remarkable public works projects of the 20th century, the design and building of the Los Angeles Aqueduct that brought water from the Owens Valley to the San Fernando Valley 233 miles to the south. It was Frederick Eaton's concept, but to engineer the massive project he chose a self-taught engineer the superintendent of the privately held Los Angeles City Waterworks, William Mulholland. A bond issue in 1905 secured the funds, but it took nearly eight years for water to flow into the San Fernando Valley. During the first two decades of the new century, street construction and maintenance took on an increasing importance. Eventually this lighting system on Broadway spread to quite a bit of downtown. Um, we found it on Hollywood Boulevard and even as far away as uh, the Reseda Business District at Sherman Way in Reseda. Throughout the 20s and into the 30s, we had an expansion of ornamental lighting. Fairly decorative, uh, not a very high level of lighting, but very nice to look at. In 1925, this growth in the lighting uh, led to the creation of the Bureau of Street Lighting. As traffic got more intense, it was obvious there needed to be higher levels of lighting for safety. So all of those things kind of uh, gradually came into being, the, the automobiles, um, more people in the city of Los Angeles, creating a recognition of that as well, that there needed to be higher lighting levels for safety and security. And the need to pave and maintain those safe streets was also growing. To help offset the cost, Public Works began to save and pave. More miles of streets could be improved at a lower cost, it was thought, if the streets were covered with gravel that could be taken from the cellars of businesses and residences. As horse-drawn carriages disappeared, asphalt became more common. Materials to build the first asphalt plant, however, were delivered in horse-drawn wagons. Of course, once streets are built, they need to be maintained. That too changed over time. As we saw the growth, specifically in downtown Los Angeles, we started seeing the development of hand crews. Uh, you'd see the, the gentleman pushing the, uh, the trash can on wheels with a broom, and it was his job to go up and down the streets, sweeping and maintaining the streets. Uh, so everything was manual swept. Then we saw the development of the horse-drawn sweepers, and it was nothing more than a horse pulling a broom that rotated on an axle, and swept the dirt and pushed it to the side of the road. Uh, it really wasn't until the uh, early 1920s up until the early 30s that we saw our first mechanical street sweeper. As the city developed, old methods in every area of LA's Public Works Department were changing. After the city began discharging its 
raw sewage into Santa Monica Bay in 1894, the neighbors started complaining almost immediately. It was obnoxious, there was grease from your kitchen cooking, floating on the, up on the ocean and coming back onto the beach. You had great mats of grease after a while build up, scum and other very nasty um, byproducts of raw sewage washing up onto the beach, not to mention it smelled as it decomposed naturally. And uh, you had these large floating mats that were very objectionable that were generated. And the beach communities got together with the state regulator at the time, the California Department of Public Health, and the city, already starting back in the mid-1910s, started receiving orders from the state to begin cleaning up the wastewater. The city grew by leaps and bounds starting in the 1910s and entering into the Roaring Twenties, it had some major issues. The large population growth had exceeded the capacity of the original design laid out in the late 1800s. The central outfall sewer that had been completed in 1908 had reached its design capacity. And as a result of this, started backing up and popping out of manholes, into people's streets, into various homes. Even as a bond measure was passed to build the North Outfall sewer and a basic screening plan at the Pacific Ocean, the city was fined for dumping raw sewage into Bologna Creek. The North Outfall sewer is one of the longest gravity sewer lines built. It ran originally from downtown to the Pacific Ocean and eventually was extended up into the San Fernando Valley and ran along the north face of the Santa Monica Mountains all the way to the extreme west end of the city in Chatsworth. Still, raw sewage received only a basic screening before being dumped into the Pacific Ocean. It wouldn't be until 1950 that the Hyperion treatment plant would be put into operation. Even as the plans for the new system were underway, massive floods hit the San Fernando Valley in 1934 and again in 1938. Floods had plagued Los Angeles throughout its history, and with the city's rapid growth, the problem only got worse. Rainwater that for years had been absorbed by miles of undeveloped land was flooding the newly paved streets, and then into LA's rivers and local creeks. The catastrophic flooding and property damage resulted in a series of failed bond issues. But then came the Federal Flood Control Act of 1936. The Army Corps of Engineers channelized portions of the Los Angeles River that ran through the city. Mountain runoff would be captured in a series of dams and flood control basins. An underground urban drainage system would be built. It's a project that wouldn't be completed until 1960. If you look at certain areas of it, you'll see that it's in, they've actually froze it in the natural shape and position when they built it. They have these beautiful parabolic shaped walls that curve beautifully perfectly in some areas that I've seen. Just following the natural uh, twists of the river, they just literally just concreted it in. In the 1920s, the Department of Public Works took the lead in helping the city of Los Angeles establish itself as a major American city. A bond issue to fund a new public library came before the voters and passed with an overwhelming 71% yes vote. But it would be four years until construction began, and another two until the doors opened in 1926. The new city hall was the brainchild of Mayor George E. Cryer. Voters accepted a $75 million bond issue in 1923 to build a new city hall, $25 million for the land and $50 million in construction costs. The Department of Public Works Bureau of Engineering oversaw the job. The concrete from which the tower was made came from sand taken from each of California's 58 counties and water from each of its 21 missions. On the doors were listed the names of the mayor, city council, the board of public works, the architects, and the contractors. But it was public works engineers, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, stonemasons, bronze workers, tile layers, painters and glazers who brought the mayor's vision to life. The building took over a year to construct and was officially dedicated in April 1928. No other building in Los Angeles would be allowed to exceed its height until 1964. The first few decades of the 20th century also saw the creation of a series of bridges across the city. Los Angeles is a very interesting bridge city. Uh, in general, when we think of bridges, we, we, we think of things like the Golden Gate Bridge or, or the George Washington Bridge in New York, the giant huge suspension spans, um, or right here in Los Angeles, the, the Terminal Island, the, the Vincent Thomas Bridge. Um, 
With, within the city, though, we really don't have many of those types of bridges because we don't have these huge long distances that require spans. But nonetheless, uh, we have the rivers and streams and storm drains that uh, naturally uh, course through this area, the rivers and streams, and then the storm drains we've built. And over each of those, we require bridges for our, our roads. The first and the most major of those bridges that were built, and, and the truly notable ones were in, in the 1920s when um, the chief of structural engineering for the Bureau of Engineering, a man named Merrill Butler, designed uh, the bridges that span the Los Angeles River just east of downtown. The Viaduct Bond Act of 1911 made possible many of the historic bridges still in use today, each with its own character and unique architectural features. The 7th Street Viaduct, for example, was built twice. Once it was built at grade. At grade means the same grade as the, as the ground. The, the bridge just took off from one side of the river and went over to the other side of the river at the same elevation. But the problem was back then that there were, along with this desire to be a big city comes transportation. And they had railroad tracks on both sides of the river that were heavily traveled then. Red cars went on the streets across the bridges uh, and had to cross those railroad tracks that went the other way alongside each bank of the river. And the red cars were, came often. So did the trains. There were frequent traffic jams. And that's one of the reasons for the Viaduct Bond Act was to raise the level of the streets up above those railroad tracks so that the red car uh, didn't want to stop for those freight trains. So they built the 7th Street Viaduct by building a new bridge on top of the old bridge. As soon as you see it, you see the one bridge and then they actually put the columns for the, for the second bridge on top of the old one. Los Angeles is probably built out as far as bridges goes. I don't think there will be a lot of new ones constructed that weren't already existing or in some form or the other. M uh, many of the bridge projects now are widening bridges or make, changing them in some way to make them more functional. Even as new streets were paved, others were being constantly widened and revised. The roadway through the Cahuenga Pass was repeatedly altered as traffic increased toward the San Fernando Valley, until the day came years later when the Hollywood Freeway opened for business. After a break in city construction during World War II, the post-war era brought even more dramatic growth in Los Angeles and the Department of Public Works. The San Fernando Valley began to transform from sparsely populated farmland to crowded suburbia. Across all of Los Angeles, city streets in the 30s and 40s numbered about 2,500 miles. By the mid-50s, that number had risen to over 6,500 miles. Trees were beginning to be seen as part of the infrastructure. A lot of folks don't understand that the urban forest in Los Angeles is the largest in the United States, over 680,000 trees. It's not only the largest urban forest, it's also the most diverse, with over a thousand different species. Compare that to other municipalities around the United States, and their species may vary between 100 and 125. In Los Angeles, it's a thousand. And that creates a number of problems for our infrastructure. The post-World War II boom out in the valley. People wanted trees. Uh, we had no policies as to the types of trees that could be planted in those communities. Many of those communities chose to, to plant, or the developers chose to plant, fast-growing species that would give shade in a matter of years, uh, within five to seven years. Particularly the ficus tree with this huge root system um, that is uh, uplifting sidewalks, curbs, streets, getting into uh, underground infrastructure, sewer lines, electrical lighting, uh, a whole host of things. As the department gained experience in planting and maintaining LA's urban infrastructure, the long years of LA's struggle in handling sanitation was entering a new phase. In 1943, the state of California again quarantined Dockwaller Beach. The basic screening plant just wasn't effective. Polluted wastewater was still being discharged into the once pristine waters. It wasn't until after World War II that the city began to develop plans for a new treatment plant. The Hyperion Treatment Plant opened in 1950. It was one of the first facilities in the world to capture energy by heating the solids so as to create methane gas and meet 85% of the plant's own power needs. It was a groundbreaking concept, 
but inefficient and inadequate to the needs of the city. The sludge the plant released into Santa Monica Bay devastated marine life. The plant often failed water quality standards. It would be another 30 years until a remedy could be found. The Bureau of Sanitation wasn't the only bureau to see changes. Public works changed with the city. The Watts riots in 1965 led to a new approach to street lighting. Until then, lighting was still ornamental and spotty across Los Angeles. In the early 60s, there were 31,000 street lights. But today, there are 220,000. The new lights, and the old ones that were upgraded, would address safety concerns and later, energy conservation. The process would take 10 years. As the energy crisis developed in the early 70s, the city also changed from the mercury vapor lamps that had become common since the 1950s to high pressure sodium. Mercury vapor and high pressure sodium both call it what we call high intensity discharge, which is a technical term meaning there's no filament in the lamp. There's a gas or a, a liquid uh, amalgam of metal that uh, is energized by an electric current running through it and it gives off light in a much more efficient way than, than a, the simple uh, incandescent lamp with its filament and also uh, lasts a lot longer. That change and the installation of photocells which switch on and off individual lights in response to the presence of the sun has saved the city millions as energy costs have skyrocketed. In the last quarter of the 20th century, public works emphasis would begin to change fundamentally. Restoring or preserving the environment would move to the forefront, and long-delayed improvements in the city's infrastructure would finally begin to take place. The Hyperion treatment plant's time had finally come. In 1972, the federal government passed the Clean Water Act. With the Clean Water Act, we were supposed to meet a new, higher level of treatment. So the city launched the Hyperion Full Secondary Project to bring the standards of Hyperion treatment plant into full compliance with federal legislation. But upgrading the vintage Hyperion plant wouldn't be easy. The city had a dilemma. It needed to basically tear down and rebuild the bulk of the plant, but it couldn't keep, it had to keep treating all the waste coming through. You know, it's very difficult to go on TV and have the mayor announce, uh, please don't flush your toilets for the next five years while we shut down and rebuild the plant. It just doesn't work. So the best analogy that's come up with is by our department council said that it's like taking a 707 you're while in flight and rebuilding into a 747. It's very difficult to, you have to do a lot of breaking up of the construction projects into a very piecemeal approach. You build new facilities in some unused land, switch the flow over to those, tear out the old outmoded facilities and then build new facilities there. When it came online, the American Public Works Association named Hyperion as one of the 10 most outstanding public works projects of the 20th century. Alongside the Golden Gate Bridge, the Panama Canal, the Interstate Highway System, and the Grand Coulee Dam. With the San Fernando Valley's expansion in the 1960s, the city also considered how to treat the additional sanitation volume. The concept became we should build some upstream treatment plants plants up away from the ocean, up in the drainage system further, to receive the sewage, treat it, and hopefully beneficially be able to reuse that water. The concept was water reclamation, and these plants are called water reclamation plants. Um, although they're, they're, they're truly sewage treatment plants that reclaim that um, as water. The two of those plants were, were talked about and conceived and planned at about the same times. The Los Angeles Glendale uh, Water Reclamation Plant, which is located on the east side of the LA River, um, adjacent to Griffith Park. And then the Donald C. Tillman Water Reclamation Plant, um, at that time called the Sepulveda Water Reclamation Plant during its planning days. And that came to fruition only after Mayor Yorty and President Nixon met in 1969 and you already sold pres the president on a need to put a treatment plant in the Sepulveda Flood Control Basin that was under the jurisdiction of the Army Corps of Engineers. And President Nixon ordered the Corps to accommodate the city. And the city engineer at that time was named Donald C. Tillman. Uh, it was largely Tillman's vision for upstream treatment and, and water reclamation for the city. Um, he was the person that mostly was responsible for pushing this concept and saying, 
Um, we may not need this today. It may, it may not be, be so obvious that we need this today, but we are clearly going to need this in the future and we need to get on with it. And so it was uh, Donald C. Tillman, the city engineer at the time, that proposed to the mayor and council that a Japanese garden be included as a part of the Tillman Water Reclamation Plant to positively demonstrate uh, the benefits of water reclamation, but also to bring a real amenity to the city, um, something very different than existed in any of the other city parks, and to bring it to the San Fernando Valley. The city also struggled to find a solution to trash collection, as landfills became scarce and volume grew exponentially. The preservation of land and the preservation of natural resources, raw materials, have given rise to recycling because recycling in effect is the reuse of the same product multiple times. So you require less use of raw materials, there's less depletion or no depletion of natural resources, and there's not a proliferation and an increase of the potential risk that landfills may pose. Recycling um, was very much in full force in the late 50s, early 60s, where bottles, cans, and other recyclable materials were being separated and recycled for, for their material value. Um, then it was discontinued because of the inconvenience that presumably recycling inherently had for the average homeowner. In California, it was compelled by state law that required that all cities in this state recycle. It took a while, but after a short-lived initial effort that proved too cumbersome for most residents, the city of Los Angeles adopted the system that's in use today, in which all recyclables go into a single blue bin. Automated trucks now pick up all refuse, another improvement which has changed and improved the lives of sanitation employees. What that has done to the efficiencies, what that has done to the uh, career longevity of our employees has been tremendous. We went from the average employee having to retire at age, generally disability-based retirement, at mid-40s, early 40s, to now serving out their careers. At a time when the private sector was only just beginning to understand the importance of providing equal opportunity to all, the Public Works Department of the City of Los Angeles was already working to create fair treatment for women and minorities. That's one of the things that I really like about the city of Los Angeles is that I really didn't see there being that much of a difference between female engineers or male engineers. I think I've been very fortunate working for the city because I have always felt very respected and have never fe felt less than by the men you know, at work and in this profession. I think that's one of the things that the city has always taken great stride in is, you know, providing for equal opportunity. In the last decades of the 20th century, the department would revisit some of its greatest achievements. The Central Library would be devastated by a fire, a fire that the Los Angeles Fire Department's chief would call the toughest structural fire he'd ever encountered. With a renovation and expansion project already in the planning stages, the city was soon able to begin the process of restoring the Los Angeles landmark. Los Angeles City Hall would see the most extensive renovations in its history, with seismic retrofitting, historic renovation, and upgrading of the building's own infrastructure to bring it into the 21st century. In November 1998, voters passed a library bond issue, $178.3 million to improve, renovate, expand, and construct 32 branch libraries. In cooperation with the library department, the Bureau of Engineering managed the huge project. It would be completed ahead of schedule and under budget. Public buildings have a responsibility to, in a, in a sense, announce um, the quality of life, announce that they are insignificant buildings. I think the libraries that the Bureau of Engineering built did a, a great job with a, a lot of help from some really talented consultants and city staff. Uh, they did a great job of making each library, giving them a unique identity, and I think public buildings should do that as well, so that the Encino Public Library has, has uh, an identity and a, 
library in South LA has a different identity. We have right now a mandate from council that all city funded projects should be uh, sustainable and meet a, a green building standard called the LEAD standard, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. We have uh, I think approximately 40 projects in the pipeline. Um, we have one right now that just won a LEED Platinum rating, which is a very, it's the highest rating that you can get for LEED projects, and that's the Lakeview Terrace Branch Library. That's today's Public Works, environmentally conscious and resource efficient, impacting the everyday quality of life in Los Angeles in ways Public Works employees 100 years ago couldn't have imagined. The Office of Community Beautification, we are part of the Board of Public Works. We're an office located within the board. We started in 1987. Um, we were then known as Operation Clean Sweep. Our mandate at the time was to go out and work with community groups to forge partnerships with the city and get people involved in sweeping up their neighborhoods, planting trees, any type of beautification or cleanup projects that their particular area needed. And that's still, I mean, we still have that program now. Last year we worked with over 17,000 volunteers citywide who donated over 70,000 hours of, of volunteer hours to cleaning up the city and planting trees and painting out graffiti and whatever their neighborhoods needed. Normally the police department and the fire department are the lead in any emergency, but the Department of Public Works comes in when we need barricades, um, when we need to block off streets, when we need things of those natures. Um, if there was an earthquake, then um, sanitation and street services would be involved in the forefront of uh, uh, removing debris. Uh, engineering is involved in um, determining if structures are sound and things of that nature. Other areas may not be as well known by the general public, but are just as critical to the Department of Public Works. What I do um, through the men and women in the Bureau of Contract Administration is to ensure that construction that is performed in the city right-of-way or on property owned by the city is done to the plans and the specifications, the quality that we desire to make sure that we get longevity in the product. Um, we also make sure that people who do the work are getting paid. Contract compliance involves uh, monitoring for various programs that we have in the city. Uh, among them are labor compliance, the uh, certification of minority women disadvantaged businesses, small local businesses, and then um, monitoring subcontractor um, outreach, and then finally um, monitoring and enforcing um, various city ordinances including equal benefits, affirmative action, uh, slavery disclosure ordinance. From streets to sewers to storm drains, from watershed protection to building and maintaining public buildings, Public Works is Los Angeles. When you think about Public Works, you really are thinking about the entire infrastructure for the city. The sewer system, the streets, you know, street lighting, uh, all the infrastructure, and I think we've made great accomplishments. Uh, Hyperion Wastewater Treatment Plant, the fact that we treat our, our wastewater before it goes to the ocean. The building of public libraries, fire stations, police stations, we've accomplished so much. We really affect people on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you talk to many of the elected officials, they'll be the first ones to tell you when they go out to the community, the first thing that a lot of the residents talk about are the potholes in their streets, about the street lights being out, the trees needing trimming, and street repairs. Five bureaus, engineering, street services, street lighting, sanitation, and contract administration under the leadership of the Board of Public Works, continue a proud tradition of service and dedication.